Okay, let's get started. This is Larry Hatcher of the Psych Department at SVSU. This is the lecture for my Psych 299 Statistics class. The general topic is analysis of variance with one between subjects factor. This is module 132.20, Basic Concepts in ANOVA. You should have received an email from me uh, telling you to go to Canvas that you can download a file that has all of these lecture notes typed up. Uh, has all the information on this slide typed up except in the file that you download I've blanked out some important terms as I go through this lecture and show you my PowerPoint slides in this video that you're watching those blanks will be filled in as you watch uh, the PowerPoint presentation you'll see what words to fill in and by the time we're done with this video your document will be complete with all the words filled in you'll have the information that you need from this lecture then in subsequent email I'll tell you what happens next everything's kind of in motion now so I'm not sure what's going to happen next keep your eyes peeled for additional emails from me so we're talking about basic concepts in ANOVA. In this video, I'm going to set up uh, the basic concepts, basic terminology that we use. It'll be a foundation and make it possible for us to move on to the more sophisticated concepts so that you can read and understand and ultimately conduct one-way analysis variance. which brings us to objectives. Uh, by the time we're done with this video, uh, you'll be able to explain the difference between experimental versus non-experimental research. You'll be able to talk about the difference between dependent versus independent variables, criterion variables and predictor variables, factors versus levels. You'll be able to talk about the difference between between subjects versus within subject factors. Analysis of variance, which we abbreviate as ANOVA, is a family of procedures used to investigate differences between the means of two or more samples. Analysis of variance is widely used. You will read about it a lot in published research articles. Many of you that are psych majors will conduct investigations where you'll analyze your data using ANOVA. Uh, the reason analysis variance is so popular is because there's many different versions of it. Uh, see that we came to our first fill in the blank here. We have came to our first fill in the blank here. I've highlighted in yellow uh, those terms and groups of terms that I had blanked out on my document. If you're following along with your blanked out document, this is the first term that you need to fill in. NOVA is popular because there's many different versions of it. Uh, there's a form of analysis variance that we use if you conduct a study with one independent variable. It's a form of ANOVA that we use if you conduct a study with two or more independent variables. We can use it if you have uh, conducted an investigation that uses between subjects design. There's a version of it we can use if you've conducted a study with a within subjects design. ANOVA is popular because there's many different versions of it. This lecture is going to focus on ANOVA with one between subjects factor. Uh, we perform this kind of ANOVA if you've conducted an investigation where you have two or more groups of subjects. Uh, each subject has provided one score on a quantitative outcome variable. You have one score on a quantitative outcome variable from each participant. Notice we've got another fill in the blank there. Um, in analyzing data from the study, you're going to compute mean score for each group of participants on your outcome variable. And then you'll use ANOVA to investigate the nature of the differences between the means displayed by those different conditions. Here's the illustrative investigation that we'll use that'll provide fictitious scenario that we'll analyze with fictitious ANOVA. This will be the illustrative investigation that we use in this module and several of the subsequent modules to follow. Imagine you've conducted an investigation where your total sample consists of 21 college students. Your independent variable is financial incentives. That's the variable you're going to manipulate. Your basic research question 
Will financial incentives affect the amount of exercise engaged in by students? You're interested in finding what kinds of manipulations can we do that will increase the amount of aerobic exercise that students engage in. Uh, your outcome variable in the study is going to be minutes of aerobic exercise that the students display in a typical week. Uh, you'll measure this using a Fitbit device. Imagine that each of the participants in your study is wearing a Fitbit device it determines when they're engaging in aerobic exercise because their pulse rate has increased uh, so you can measure the total number of minutes that a given subject has engaged in aerobic exercise in a typical week that's the outcome variable that you're hoping to influence in your study, your independent variable is financial incentives, as I've indicated. Here we have another fill in the blank to fill in. Uh, financial incentives is going to be a limited value variable. When you analyze data using ANOVA, the independent variable typically is a limited value variable. You recall from earlier in the semester we said a limited value variable is one that consists of two to six conditions. Imagine at the beginning of the semester, a given student was randomly assigned to one of three treatment conditions. At the beginning of the semester, subject is told, at the end of the semester, you'll be rewarded with a specific number of dollars for each minute of exercise that you engaged in during a typical week of the semester. You randomly assign each participant to one of three treatment conditions. One of your treatment conditions is the low incentive condition. Uh, you assign seven subjects to this condition. Participants in this condition are told uh, that you'll be rewarded with one dollar for each minute of exercise that you engage in on average during a typical week of the semester. Uh, monitor how many minutes of exercise you engage in uh, in each week of the semester. Determine what your average minutes of exercise for a typical week is. Uh, what kind of payment can a subject in this condition expect? For example, if a subject has engaged in 60 minutes of exercise during a typical week of the semester, uh, they're told that they'll receive $60 at the end of the semester. That's because of the condition they're in. Uh, they were told at the outset you get $1 for each minute of exercise that you participate in in typical week of the semester. At the end of the week semester, Fitbit says they engaged in 60 minutes of exercise per week. At the end of the semester, they'll receive just $60. That's not very much money. That's why we call them the low incentive condition. Another seven participants are assigned to the medium incentive condition. Uh, their rewards are going to be a little more attractive. Participants in this condition are told that you'll be rewarded with $25 for each minute of exercise that you engage in on average during a typical week of the semester. For example, if a subject in this condition engages in 60 minutes of exercise in a typical week, they will instead receive $1,500 at the end of the semester. That's because they're getting $25 per minute average over the course of the semester. That's a little bit more attractive. They're in the medium incentive condition. And finally, one third of the subjects, the seven people in all, are assigned to be in the high incentive condition. Uh, at the beginning, they're told that you'll be rewarded with $50 for each minute of exercise that you engage in on average during a typical week of the semester. For example, participant in this condition, if they engage in 60 minutes of exercise in a typical week, they'll receive $3,000 at the end of the semester. That's why we call them the high incentive condition. In our investigation, dependent variable, which we'll abbreviate as DV, dependent variable is minutes of aerobic exercise that the participant engages in in a typical week over the course of the 16-week semester. As I said, we'll measure this with a Fitbit device so that we'll know uh, how many minutes per week they're engaging in aerobic exercise. This dependent variable, minutes for aerobic exercise, is a quantitative variable, which is necessary if we're going to analyze the data with ANOVA. Uh, this outcome variable is measured on a ratio scale. In general, we want our outcome variable to be 
be measured on the inter either an interval scale or a ratio scale because we're eventually going to compute means for each condition. And if you're going to compute means, you want your outcome variable to be measured on an interval scale or ratio scale. Research hypothesis, which we'll investigate in this study. Research hypothesis states, individuals in the high incentive condition will engage in more exercise minutes than those in the medium incentive condition and those in the medium incentive con and those in the medium incentive condition will engage in more exercise minutes than those in the low incentive condition that's our research hypothesis by the end of the study we hope to get support for that idea this figure illustrates some possible results from the study. Uh, anytime I talk about an investigation, I like to show a figure that illustrates potential results, helps people get a more concrete idea of what we're hoping for. Uh, maybe by the end of the investigation, we get something like this. Uh, with this figure, I'm plotting exercise minutes on the axis on the left ranging anywhere from 0 to 90 minutes of exercise per week. Uh, on the x-axis, I'm indicating the three treatment conditions of my financial incentives independent variable, the low incentive group, the medium incentive group, the high incentive group. Uh, with this set of fictitious outcomes, it looks like the high incentive condition scored relatively high on exercise minutes. Medium incentive condition scored a lot lower. Low incentive condition scored lower still. I have drawn uh, some whiskers to indicate 95% confidence intervals for these treatment condition means. Uh, this is totally fictitious. I show this just to give you a sense of what kind of outcome we might get by the end of the semester er, uh, and by the end of the investigation. In this investigation, our dependent variable uh, is the outcome variable. Dependent variable is some aspect of participants' behavior performance that, which may be influenced by the independent variable. As indicated before, if you're going to analyze the data with analysis of variance, the outcome variable must be a quantitative variable. In this investigation, the dependent variable was exercise minutes. Uh, it's okay to call it a dependent variable in this study because we're conducting a true experiment. However, a dependent variable should instead be called a criterion variable if your investigation uses a non-experimental research design. Uh, in a minute we'll talk about the difference between experimental research designs versus non-experimental research designs. An independent variable in a true experiment is the construct that's manipulated by the researcher to see if it has an effect on the dependent variable. Uh, in analysis of variance, the independent variable is usually a limited value variable. As I mentioned before, limited value variable is one that consists of two to six categories. In the current investigation, the independent variable was financial incentives. Uh, if you're conducting a non-experimental study instead of a true experiment, uh, this variable should be called a predictor variable variable instead. Uh, independent variables should be called predictor variable in a non-experimental investigation. We try to restrict the use of the terms independent and dependent variable only to true experiments, which is the very next topic. True experiment is an empirical investigation in which the researcher actively manipulates an independent variable and maintains a high degree of control over variables that are likely to influence the dependent variable. Uh, I try to be picky about whether I refer to something as a true experiment or not. We're going to see that one of the most important characteristics a study should have, if we're going to call it a true experiment, uh, the researcher should actively manipulate the independent variable. I'll try to eventually give you a sense of what I mean by that most important characteristic of a true experiment, whether the researcher actively manipulates an independent variable. Uh, the way that we typically manipulate a variable is through random assignment to conditions. How this is achieved in our current investigation, random assignment to conditions. See the next figure. Um, 
I said this before, but I'll say it again to kind of emphasize the idea of random assignment. The way that I know I'm manipulating a true independent variable is because in my investigation, I began with a pool of 21 participants. I randomly assigned half of them to the low incentive condition. I randomly assigned, did I say half? I meant seven. Of my 21 participants, I randomly assigned seven of them to the low incentive condition, randomly assigned a different seven to the medium incentive condition, randomly assigned a different seven to the high incentive incentive condition because I'm in control of what incentive condition is experienced by a participant. Uh, I know that I'm in charge of it. I'm manipulating it. Uh, that's how I know that I'm randomly assigning people to treatment conditions and that's how I know that this is a true experiment. It's not a non-experimental investigation. Non-experimental investigation is an empirical study in which the researcher does not actively manipulate independent variable nor maintain a high degree of control over the variables that are likely to influence the dependent variable. If it's a non-experimental investigation, uh, instead the researcher simply measures where the subjects stand on naturally occurring variables. That term, naturally occurring variables, you heard it earlier in the semester. Uh, let's talk about that again. Naturally occurring variable is a trait or attribute that the subject already had prior to participating in the study. Examples of naturally occurring variables include things like age, political party membership, like Democrat versus Republican versus Independent, level of depression that somebody is displaying at the time they enter the study. Uh, notice what they all have in common is it's a trait or attribute that the subject already had before they came to the study. It's not something that I, the researcher, was in charge of. It's not something that I uh, force them uh, to experience. For example, I wouldn't call some people to be Democrats. I wouldn't call some people to be Republicans. Uh, I can't manipulate political party. That makes it a naturally occurring variable. Naturally occurring variable can also be a voluntary choice that's made during the course of the investigation. For example, how might we turn our current study into a non-experimental study by letting subjects volunteer for treatment conditions? Now here's a figure that illustrates possible results from the study. It's the same figure that I showed you before, uh, but I'll show it to you again to give you a sense of how we could turn our experiment into a non-experimental study by allowing people to volunteer for treatment conditions. Imagine this. I have a pool of 21 participants that are going to uh, be subjects in my study. I tell them about my investigation from the outset. I tell them, I'd like about a third of you to be in my low incentive condition. People in this condition will be paid $1 for each minute of exercise they engage in in a typical week of the semester. I would like one third of you to be in my medium incentive condition. People in this condition will get $25 for each minute of exercise they engage in a typical week. And I'd like one third of you to be in my high incentive condition. People in this condition will get $50 for each minute of exercise they engage in in a typical week. Now, who wants to be in my low incentive condition? Who wants to be in the medium incentive condition? Who wants to be in the high incentive condition? I allow people to volunteer for treatment conditions. If I did that, it would make the study a lot weaker. If I allowed people to volunteer for treatment conditions, and if at the end of the semester I got results like the results I have here, with these people scoring high and these people scoring lower, I can't be sure why I got the results that I got. Maybe these people scored high on exercise minutes because they were being paid a high amount of incentive dollar to participate in exercise. Maybe not. Maybe these people would have exercised that much anyhow. Maybe the kind of people that volunteer to get a lot of money for exercising are the kind of people that would have exercised a lot anyhow even if they had not been paid. Because I allowed people to volunteer for treatment conditions, it's no longer a true experiment. And so I can no longer unambiguously interpret the results that I got from the study. Uh, Non-experimental investigations are weak in that way. 
Now, having discussed the difference between true experiments and non-experimental investigations, remember that analysis variance can be used with both kinds of studies. Analysis variance can be used to analyze data from true experiments, and it can be analyzed, used to analyze data from non-experimental investigations. I just ask my students to be careful about the terms they use. To so use the terms independent variable and dependent variable only if it's a true experiment. Uh, if it was non-experimental investigation, it's better to use the terms predictor variable and criterion variable because they are more general purpose terms. Type of ANOVA covered in this module is the kind of ANOVA that we use when we've conducted investigation with a single factor. This is a good place to define some more terms. Concept factor you'll hear a lot when we talk about analysis variance. A factor is a categorical variable. A factor is essentially the same thing as an independent variable in a true experiment or a categorical predictor variable in a non-experimental investigation. Whenever you hear the word factor, think of it as being pretty much a synonym for independent variable. It's the categorical variable that we're investigating in the study. In the current investigation, the name for our factor is financial incentives. That's the independent variable that I was manipulating. By definition, a factor consists of two or more levels. This is another term to be defined. Uh, the levels are the categories, conditions, groups, or samples under the independent variable. In typical investigation that we analyze with ANOVA, we usually have two to six levels, two to six treatment conditions. There are actually three levels in the current study, the low incentive condition, the medium incentive condition, the high incentive condition. When you hear the word level, that's pretty much the same thing as treatment condition. Terms experimental group versus control group. You learned about this earlier in the semester. This is a good time to refresh our memory on it. Experimental group is the group that receives the treatment of interest. Whatever it is that you're manipulating in your uh, in experiment, whatever is the focus of your study, the thing that you believe is going to produce some kind of an effect, uh, that is the thing that you give to the experimental group. That's the treatment of interest. Experimental group is the one that receives the treatment of interest. The control group is the group that does not. In the current investigation, it would make sense to think of the control group as being the low incentive condition. Uh, they're the group that are experiencing things pretty much the way a typical person in the world would experience things. They're getting hardly any money at all for exercising. That's what the typical person on the streets gets for exercising. So the low incentive condition comes closest to being a control group for our study. Uh, experimental groups would be the two other conditions. The medium incentive condition that was getting 25 bucks per minute of exercise and the high incentive condition that was getting 50 bucks per minute of exercise. For the kind of ANOVA that we're learning about in this module, the factor has to be a between subjects factor. Uh, that means we must have done an investigation that made use of a between subjects research design. You learned about between subjects research designs earlier. Let's talk about them again. Between subjects research design means that a given participant is exposed to just one of the treatment conditions. In the current investigation, uh, we use the between subjects research design. We know that it's between subjects because a given participant experienced either the low incentive condition or they experienced the medium in incentive condition or they experienced the high incentive condition. But in our investigation, there was no participant that experienced all three conditions. We call it a between subjects factor because it allows us to make comparisons between different groups of participants. At the end of the investigation, we'll be able to say uh, which group of people scored better on exercise minutes. This group or this group or this group. We'll be able to make comparisons between these three different groups of participants.
A different kind of ANOVA, not covered in this module, is ANOVA with one within subjects factor. Uh, you use this to analyze data from studies that have used the within subjects research design, which is also called a repeated measures research design. A within subjects factor is a factor in which each participant is exposed to all of the conditions. Let's talk about how we could change the current investigation so that it had a within subjects factor rather than a between subjects factor. Imagine that we had, let's say, 10 participants rather than 21 participants. Uh, if you were a participant in the investigation, and if we were manipulating things as a within subjects factor, if you're a participant in uh, the investigation, you'd be exposed to the low incentive condition, and you'd provide a score on the dependent variable. If you're a participant in this study, you would also be exposed to our medium incentive condition and provide another score on the dependent variable. And if you're a participant in the study, you'd also be exposed to the high incentive condition and provide yet another score in the dependent variable. For example, if we want to get this done all in one semester, uh, we might have you spend five weeks in the low incentive condition and determine how many minutes of exercise did you uh, display when you're in this low incentive condition. Later in the semester, you might spend five weeks in the medium incentive condition. We'll determine how many minutes of exercise do you display when you're getting medium incentives. And then finally, for the last five weeks of the semester, you'd be exposed to the high incentive condition. We'd get another score that would tell us how many minutes of exercise you got when you're in that condition. We call it a within subjects research design because a given subject has provided a separate score under each treatment condition. This allows us to make comparisons within subjects. It allows us to ask questions along the lines of, did this specific participant score highest under the low incentive condition, or under the medium incentive condition, or under the high incentive condition? For a given subject, it allows us to make comparisons within that subject, and that's why it's called a within subjects research design. If you use within subjects research design, you have to analyze your data using ANOVA with one within subjects factor, not ANOVA with one between subjects factor, which we're covering now. Summary of the main points made in this module. There's a difference between experimental research versus non-experimental research. When you think experimental research, think of the kind of study where the researcher is in charge. A researcher is actively manipulating an independent variable. Non-experimental research, the researcher is not manipulating things. Researcher is just measuring where people stand on naturally occurring variables. Uh, think of us as using the terms dependent variable and independent variable only if it's a true experiment where the researcher is manipulating things. If it's a non-experimental investigation, it's better to refer to the variables as being criterion variables and predictor variables. When you think factor, think that's essentially the same thing as the independent variable if we're looking at a true experiment. When you hear the word level, think of that as being pretty much the same thing as a treatment condition if we're looking at a true experiment. With a between subjects research design, totally different groups of people are assigned to different treatment conditions. If it's a between subjects design, no subject is exposed to all of the treatment conditions. If it's a within subjects research design, a given participant is exposed to each treatment condition, and this participant provides a separate score on the dependent variable under each of those treatment conditions. If this were a regular semester, next up would be our discussion exercise 13220, which deals with factors and levels. And that, in turn, would result to an online quiz that goes by this name. I am not sure how I'm going to handle the discussion exercise and the online quiz. Uh, I won't 
surprise you with anything. Keep an eye on your email. I'll let you know what my thinking is as my thinking develops. I'll try to figure out what's the best way to handle this discussion exercise that we otherwise would have used as the discussion discussion exercise. Um, I may wind up giving you the online quiz dealing with that discussion exercise, but I'll give you plenty of heads up. I'll tell you that I want you to look over the discussion exercise. Maybe I'll have you answer the questions on your own. Uh, then eventually I'll make this online quiz available that pertains to the discussion exercise. Again, I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to handle that. Uh, keep your eye on your email and I'll let you know as my thinking develops.